Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the host and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have problems with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West, transmitting across the internet. This is episode 294 of Registry Matters. Good evening, my insidious friend. How are you? Doing awesome. It's a balmy 65 degrees here with not a cloud in the sky. You probably don't really ever get clouds, though. You, so the national average, if I'm not mistaken, it's 205 days of sun per year, and this is important to me for a bunch of personal reasons. But you probably get, I don't know, 300 days of sun a year? That is correct. It's a little over 300 average. Oh, is it really? Days. I guessed. I was just bullshitting. Yeah. I just guessed. Yeah, so uh, we get between 8 and 11 inches of precipitation annually. Oh, my God. Wow. All right, then. Um, so remember to show your support by hitting the like and subscribe button or give a five-star rating on your podcast app. It really makes a difference for us. We truly appreciate your love, and in return, we're here to keep delivering content you'll enjoy. If you're feeling generous, Patreon support would also be incredibly valued. Thank you for being a part of our community. We do have a couple new people that I will mention at the end of the show. And uh, so... What are we doing this evening, sir? We're going to be wasting a bunch of time. <laughs> that I believe. Hey, are, are we joined by anybody this week? No, it's just the two of us. We've got a vacationing uh, partner right now. He's gone off to uh, uh, Thailand, Southeast, Southeast Asia. I uh, wasn't going to disclose it, but yeah, he's oh, going he... off to Southeast Asia. It was funny. He's, he calls me. He's like, hey, I've got to run over here for real quick. I was like... No, nobody goes there real quick, man. Like, how do you do that real quick? It's a, it's twenty hours of, of flights and one. <laughs> so, but yeah, we're going to be doing legislative advocacy. We're going to be discussing some bills that are pending in West Virginia, Oklahoma. Going to cover our own state of New Mexico, the land of enchantment. Also, we have some articles that time is not likely to permit. And Andy and I will discuss a case that I've been assisting with a local attorney to convince the client to accept a plea officer offer, and I know how much you really love the plea process. I do. We, you know, we should all stop taking plea deals, Larry. That way we would collapse the whole system. So, yes, well, you're going to explain that to you later in the, uh, actually, it's in the early on in the program. And also, we have a comment that you're going to read from one of our loyal supporters. Yeah, well, not so much supporter. He was a guest recently. I wouldn't so much say a loyal supporter. Yeah, a friend of mine. But he said, and this is from Bob, who we had on about a month or maybe two months ago, talking about being a, a pro se person trying to get yourself off the registry. And uh, he said, you asked to let me know if there are any issues with traveling. So I'm writing from the transfer bus outside of the Miami port. We're heading to the airport now. Keep in mind... MSC, I looked this up, Larry. I don't know what MSC cru MSC Cruise Line is, but he says it's the only cruise line that doesn't do background checks, according to my travel agent wife. Zero issues getting on the cruise at all. We stopped at their private island and Nassau. That's it. As we were getting, uh, excuse me, as we were exiting the boat, my wife's card was scanned first and immediately flagged. We were pulled aside and escorted to customs where they searched all. And I mean all our bags and items in our pockets. It took about 20 to 30 minutes. The guy searching our stuff was very respectful. Of course, all we had uh, was uh, some, a few t-shirts and my wife's rum cake. That's really all. I doubt we'll have any issues flying home from Miami, but I'll let you know if we do. So he traveled internationally, which, you know, is the Caribbean. I mean, it's technically international, but pretty much, you know, it's the United States tourists that go to those locations. However, he's done it a bunch of times and has no issues, and he has a passport that is marked, and he's on the registry. So, well, that is helpful to know that, but could it be because it's that particular cruise line, MSC, or, or can we deduce anything further? I, I can't deduce anything further other than him and uh, one of our very loyal patrons travels quite regularly to, you know, east coast of Florida kind of range, you know, Bermuda and then the uh, eastern and, and western Caribbean area and haven't had any problems. So, and I, they both have passports that are marked and both on the registry. Just sharing. That's really all I needed, I wanted to do. Well, thank you, Bob. 
and then uh, so we're going to talk about coercing a plea deal. I didn't even like make. Oh Jesus! Uh, I didn't even make any uh, like a title card for this one. So we'll just have to. I'll, I'll maybe make it while we're going through this. But so uh, you've been working on uh, coercing. Now, L Larry, can can we can we work with this coercing word? Are you like twisting the person's arm? Well, that's what you said when we were con conversing about it. I don't believe I was coercing anybody. <laughs> so, well, I, I guess we need to know more about this. But so, can we go into it for a little bit? Uh, yes, we can. It's a great case to ex examine and explain the pros and cons of the plea negotiation process. In my uh, opinion, this offer is in the client's best interest. Aren't they usually in the client's best interest, Larry? Well, that's what the attorney tells them. Sometimes, maybe not. But upon thorough examination and my years of expertise, in my opinion, and the attorney concurs with my opinion, that's why she was actually seeking a second opinion from someone who she trusted. The attorney agrees. And uh, so, yeah, we went through all the pros and cons of the plea offer. offer and and uh, there's a couple offers we'll get into as we go through this. And uh, so what was his charge? Oh, it's criminal sexual penetration of a minor between 13 and 16, and there are five counts. Uh, I've heard you speak often about maximum exposure. Yeah, that top conversation, that topic comes up pretty regularly. Explain what you mean by that, and what is his maximum exposure? Well, the way I use the term and the way it's used professionally, generally, is maximum exposure. We look at the charge, and we look at all the charges that you have pending against you. And we look at the maximum sentences imposable by statute, and we add those up, and that gives us a maximum number. Uh, if if the court were to impose, say you got convicted of all the counts of all the different things that they'd brought against you, and the judge maxed you, and they stacked them consecutively, that's what we mean by maximum exposure. Now, those are ingredients that seldom happen. You seldom are going to get maxed out. But you could. So so we always like to tell people what their maximum exposure is. I yeah, and so, so when you are going through with plea offers, they will not not even necessarily plea them down to lower felonies, but possibly run them concurrent. So they're all running at the same time, even if you have 10 charges and they're five years each. You're running 10 all at the same time. So you only end up with five years tops. That is correct. Now, in his particular case. He's facing, on the indictment, he's facing five, four, three felonies, which carry a maximum exposure of 18 months each. So if you do 18 months each times five, you get a total exposure of 90 months, and that translates to 7.5 years. Good time can reduce that day for day. So is he's this looking federal or is this in, in this is state? state this is state of New Mexico charges. So okay. if, if you if you had five felonies in any other state, you'd be facing a whole lot more time than that. Maybe. It's maximum right. exposure. Yeah, your maximum exposure. Uh, 18 months for a felony is exceedingly low. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I'm seeing the seven and a half, but that would be the maximum. Okay. I got gotcha. you. So, um, and then, so you told me that he, the accused has proclaimed his innocence. And how can you insist that he plead guilty to something that he did not do? Why would you do that, Larry? Well, it's easy to answer that. Well, we're examining uh, how to handle a disposition of a case. The question is not so much what you did but it's what they can convict you of doing. And that sounds silly to people, but we're, we're looking at, can they convict you of this? And they have a credible witness that has insisted that she'll testify, and her testimony will be that they had sex, and she was beneath the age of uh, 16, which was not a lawful sexual activity for a 39-year-old at the time. And uh, so she's now 17 years old and very composed as far as witnesses go. And, and the other problem for him is he chose to engage in this endeavor in a very rural conservative county. <laughs> I, th I thought you were entitled to equal justice under the law, though. Well, you are, I, but we cannot change the reality of, of what a jury in Lincoln County, New Mexico, is likely to do. But yes, you are entitled to it, but trying to get it is a different matter. So let's see. Did you get like the thumb screws out for him? To help to help convince him to accept the plea deal. Are you implying that I was heavy-handed with him? 
I, I, I'm just trying to get the specifics about how did you coerce him? How did you entice him, incentivize him? Because if the guy's not guilty, why wouldn't you stand up and, and profess to the universe that you are innocent of what they are accusing you of? Well, that's part of what helped win him over. I told him I love trials and I love uh, the experience and the excitement. Um, I said, if, uh, if your attorney wants to do the trial and you're willing to pay the compensation to have me there assisting, I said, I can't wait to be there. <laughs> I said, but the problem is greater than that in terms of what you're looking at. Uh, they've offered him a plea to two counts of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. And that is a non-registrable offense. And we don't have that provision in our law that says that if it was sexually motivated, that you can be ordered to register anyway. It has to be a registrable offense. So they offered him, they're basically going to max him out on those two charges because they're, they're also fourth degree felonies. So they're going to give him three years. And uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with these being nonviolent offenses, he will be under the 50% rule rather than having to serve 85%. So he's going to do a year and a half. Uh, 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 and the other option is he played the two counts of the criminal sexual penetration with no agreement on sentencing. So they, there would still be the cap of the statutory limits, meaning that if they let him only plead to two, the worst they could do for him is give him uh, uh, a year and a half on each three years. So you're sitting there saying, well, if he could only get the worst by uh, uh, pleading to the CSP, but see, he doesn't want to plead to the CSP because the likely, uh, he, there's no likelihood that he would have to register. And so he doesn't want to plead to a sexual offense. And so he's got the option to plead to a non-sexual offense in due time, or he's got the option to plead to a sexual offense and argue for probation. I will just about guarantee you that in this jurisdiction, it's most likely he would get prison time anyway. And the prosecution knows that. That's why they're offering him to plead with no agreement to sentencing, because they know that he's going to get prison time. So why on earth, I mean, being that you're a brilliant guy, why on earth would you want to plead with no agreement to sentencing, likely get a three-year prison sentence anyway, then come out of prison with a indeterminate period of parole, which is five to twenty for that particular charge, and have to be on the PFR registry. And his home state is Louisiana, and uh, uh, so why would you do that? And the registry scenario, the registry umbrella in New Mexico is just as tough as Louisiana. No, but he's not going to be under our law here registering. He doesn't. He intends to come back, uh, back to Louisiana. So in our state, yes, the registry would be very benign as compared to Louisiana. This would be a ten-year offense. But he's choosing not to live here. You got to understand these communist states like Colorado, New Mexico. <laughs> people communist, don't want to. Huh? Yes, I was working with a person a few weeks ago that said that, I think I told you, I don't know if we did it on the air, but I told you that he got off the registry in Colorado and he's determined to go back to Texas where he was convicted. Jesus. And he said he has to get out of the communist state of Colorado. And I said, well, let me see if I got, heard you correctly. I said, so you're leaving the communist state of Colorado that gave you your life back by releasing you from the freedom-loving state of Texas that won't give you your life back and will not release you, and you're going to go back to the state he said, yeah, but I, I just need to try to get off there, too. And I said, okay, makes perfect sense to me. But anyway, th th that's what he wants to go back to Louisiana because, see, they're civilized down there. And we're a bunch of lefty lunatics out here. Well, I mean, I'm going to point out that we have someone visiting us in chat who normally does listen to the show. And he went from super red place to super blue place because they have a much more gooder registry scenario. And I think he's loving it because he has a... Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he has a timeout. He doesn't have to go petition or anything. He will time out that is, and get that off is the correct. registry. That is correct. And, uh, I normally don't uh, encourage people to state shop, but in that particular instance, I did tell the person, I mean, if you're ready to uh, get off of your right-wing high horse, <laughs> go to, <laughs> there are still states where you could have a much nicer life. Or you could try to fix the state of Wyoming. And uh, you know, fixing that state is going to be very difficult. It's almost like as bad as fixing Mississippi or Alabama. Hmm. There ain't no fixing Alabama. Not after what just happened. There ain't no fixing that mess. So, 
So, do you think uh, that we could like cut those states off and just push them off into the into the uh, Gulf of Mexico? Uh, well, I wish we could, but but now can you at least <laughs> can you at least admit him wanting to go back to Louisiana is funny? That's hilarious. He this is an individual that doesn't listen to the show and has no idea how insignificant the registry would be in New Mexico compared to how really the inshitification of the registry would be like to live in Louisiana. Like your life would just be horrid. Yes. Well, uh, it's even funnier that he drives a truck for a living, which means that he took the plea to the CSP, criminal sexual penetration. And in the strange circumstance that he actually did receive probation, he would have all the problems related to interstate travel while under supervision. Mm-hmm. And beyond that, he would get prison. Uh, if he got prison time, he'd be subject to indeterminate parole supervision, which is what I explained earlier. This plea is in his best interest. Can you bring yourself to admit that? I can definitely bring myself to admit that. <laughs> so, so uh, do you, would, would it be, um, if, suppose you were to bring the, the, if you could figure out how to like make the parallel charges of what it would be like in Louisiana to present that to him, this is what it'd be like in your home state. Oh, I, I did, I did tell him what the registry would be like there in terms of the, uh, the paying for the community notification and some of the pitfalls. And he thought he'd be under New Mexico law. He says, well, let me make sure I understand this. He said, so you're (laughs) telling me, and he actually talks this way. He said, you're telling me that New Mexico punishes me and I have to follow Louisiana's law. And I said, yeah, because the registry is not a part of your punishment. I said, they're just simply advising you that you have to register. I said, but that's only valid for New Mexico. Theoretically, you could go to another state that didn't have a registry and you wouldn't have to register. I said, but unfortunately for you, all 50 states have a registry and and Louisiana has one of the really bad ones. But he had no idea about interstate compact. He had no idea about the nuances of having, uh, I said, if with your uh, supervision, you're going to run into all sorts of travel barriers for work because you're going to be in a state 40, uh, 49 hours and you're going to be stuck on that registry list for the rest of your life. And I said, this is just not something you can deal with. And I said, you're going to go to prison anyway if you plead to the CSP. I mean, the likelihood is very low that he would get probation. And I can tell you the factors are he's out of town, so he doesn't likely have any influence levers he can pull in Lincoln County. And he's got someone who's fairly well connected from what the attorney told me. And they're trying to make sure that uh, justice is done. And he is going to be hometown if he were to go to trial. And it's going to be an unbelievable thing for a 39-year-old man to say, well, he was 39 at the time, but it's going to be unbelievable to a jury there for this beautiful girl who would have no motivation to lie to come in and say we had sex a half dozen times. And him saying, nope, we ain't never had no sex at all. It's all in her mind. All we did is made out. Oh, is that all you did? You just made out. Well, that makes all the difference. You're 39 and she was 15 and and, and all you did was made out. Well, all right. Thanks for telling us that. We're still going to convict you. The thing is, Larry, that in Louisiana, that's probably accepted. Well, in this particular county, it probably is as well. But they're not going to be happy about someone driving across the country and taking advantage of their pristine purity. Yes. (laughs) So, but just, it is, it is incredibly hard for the uninitiated, the un, the unexposed to this, to think that all of this is bearing down on you for something of a natural act that you, you, all of this is coming down on you. And if you've had no exposure to the criminal justice system, that all of this with the registry, with prison and all that stuff is coming down at you. You didn't rob a bank. You didn't like, there's just, it's just hard for someone that's not. Uh, involved in it prior to to accept all that's coming you got that correct he even had that discussion with me he said that with all the real crime that's going out there in new mexico because we we tend to have a higher (laughs) crime rate than uh, in many categories than most of the other states he said i would have thought that they wouldn't even bother with a case like this i said yeah you believe in the overworked understaffed thing i said but they're not too overworked or understaffed for sex crimes you don't happen to know which parish he's from in Louisiana, do you? I do not, but he certainly sounded it. Or he sounded like he was from the boonies, and he seems to well, like to hang what out. Because what you mimicked him is not how Louisianians sound 
and I, I wish I could get Brian to unmute himself and list, <laughs> list, uh, let us listen to how a real coon ass sounds, because it's, it is unbelievable how real Cajun sound. So, well, uh, he told me at the end of the conversation I'd been very helpful, and uh, I told him, please call me back. You've got my private number. Call me back here and other questions. And I said, if you just change your mind, I said, I am all in for trial. And that's what pe attorneys don't tell their clients enough. You need to tell them, attorneys out there, I know there are hundreds of them listening. Tell your client, I am delighted to do the trial. It gives me great experience. And I'm going to go home and have my regular life regardless yeah. of how the trial goes. But I'm worried about you. But if you One want to do thing, this though. trial, I'm going to give it my best effort. Price wise to, to have somebody to take someone to a plea deal versus taking them through a trial. What is the cost difference like zeros added to the end of it? Unfortunately, that's one of the con things that goes on the legal profession. They they price it as if it's going to go to trial, knowing that it's not likely to go to trial. And they tell you up front. They say, well, I haven't really gotten deep into discovery, but based on what you've told me, sounds like we've got some good defenses on this. And, and uh, so they quote you a fee, then they'll say this will take you all the way through trial, no appeal included. And then after you get the fee paid, the 25000 or whatever it is, when you get the fee paid, then they've been reviewing the discovery and talking to the prosecutor and getting a lot of details and possibly even done pretrial witness interviews. And then they come back to you and tell you, we can't do this trial. Well, see, I would have told them up front and I would have lost the case. I would have told the guy up front, hey, you know, <laughs> under the fact pattern, before I even look at a single shred of discovery, with these facts, they're not going to like you very much and they're going to be looking for a way to convict you. And so if you're going to plan to do a trial, not negotiate, it's going to be at least twenty five, thirty five thousand. But I'm at first blush. I don't think your odds are going to be very good at trial. Well, what he's going to do is pick up and walk out of this office, and he's going to go down the street and say, I can't believe the gloom and doom that I just encountered with a person who hadn't even seen any of the paperwork telling me that I'm doomed at trial. I'm not going to hire a quack like that. That's exactly what he would do. <laughs> so. And you wonder why people have a lack of trust in attorneys based on what you just described. I don't wonder at all. I know exactly why they have a lack of trust. <laughs> but I helped him work through this because I'm letting him know your attorney is a very fine attorney, and she is. And I said, she can put on a great trial, and she could, but you're not likely to win. And yeah. that's only a, a judgment call you can make if you want to be maxed out at 90 months, assuming you get stacked. And you could get stacked. I can't guarantee you that you wouldn't because there'd be no limitations on the judge at sentencing. If you want to get stacked with 90 months, and if you want to come out with an indeterminate period of supervision following you, go right ahead. Because, like I say, it'll be fascinating to me. I haven't done a trial in several years. It'll be fascinating to do one. <laughs> Shall we move along, sir? Let's do it. All right. So now you want to talk about some legislation around the country this week. I guess some, most, many of the legislative bodies that are specifically the ones that are part-time are kind of shutting down so we can kind of have an after-action review, so to speak. And so we're going to first bring up New Mexico. What do you have to report from your home state? Well, we were successful this session. There was a PFR registration bill introduced in the House of Representatives. In fact, it wasn't a terrible bill overall, but it needed more fixing than our 30-day session is equipped to handle. And we're hoping to make those adjustments and bring it back next year. There was a, pose, a proposal to impose the death penalty for child sex offenses. And I remember your arrogance when it was introduced. You stated that it has no chance of passing. Were you right? I was, but not just because of being arrogant. I was right because procedurally it, it never got past the House Rules and Order Committee because in our state, in a short session, it has to be deemed germane to the session and to be germane it has to have a governor's message and it's called an executive message and or it has to be budget matter and since this didn't have a governor's message there was no way in the world it could it could be it could pass that initial test to be germane so i knew it was going to pass because it couldn't get out of committee so that one was easy 
can you can you stay here for just a minute that I haven't quite heard this sort of description of I, I understand the House and Rules whatever order committee that there are two, three, four committees that a bill will have to go through before it goes for a full vote. But what is this you're saying about a short session that the governor has to sign off on it? Yeah, in a 30 day session, it's really just for the purposes of crafting a budget. So if you want to go beyond that, every lawmaker can put forth their own budget if they wanted to. And they can put forth spending proposals if they want to. But anything beyond that, the executive has to issue a message. So if the executive hasn't issued a message, it is not deemed germane. So the first committee it goes through in a short session is if it's a House bill, it goes through the House uh, rules and the same thing on the Senate side. If it's a Senate bill, it goes through Senate rules to see if it if it's the message is included. If there's no message, then if you can't pass their their germaneness test, then it doesn't move forward. So in, in other words, every other year you have to really worry about things, but on those other years, like a, a lot of stuff that would come down the pike doesn't even matter. Doesn't matter. You can introduce anything you want to, but without a message, it's not going anywhere. Now, the governor messaged the uh, the uh, sort of bill that we're going to talk about a little bit later as okay. we go through this. So, All right. Well, what was the bill number for this PFR registration bill and who drafted the proposal? Oh, it was uh, House Bill 282, and certainly the sponsors did not draft it. It was presented to them by the Department of Public Safety, and they simply filed the bill. And uh, so that's that's what happened. All right. And so I, I took a look at it, and if, if you can believe that, I noticed that there was some wording that carefully crafted, that was carefully crafted to protect PFRs. Are you telling me that DPS did that? They put in language that protected some PFRs? I am... Um, not telling you that. They actually used some of my recommendations that I put forward in previous proposals that have not gone through. So, But they've uh, been willing under the current leadership to be more compromising. So that's why this bill that was put forward, if it, if it had been a 60-day session, we probably could have fixed it, but we just didn't have time. Interesting. Um, and the proposal adds new offenses to the list of registrable offenses. And I noticed that the wording is very clear to protect those that have been previously convicted of those offenses. Would you please explain this for us uh, small brain people? Uh, well, sure. The, the language I used, I promise you, it's not the best in artfully drafting, but it was the best I could come up with. So the language that I have got in there as a placeholder is when we define a sex offense, it means any of the following offenses or their equivalents in, in any other jurisdiction committed on or after the date the offense became registrable in New Mexico. And this means that we will not have to in, engage in litigation for those who have previously pled or been convicted to one of the new, re, newly registrable offenses because you're only a sex, you're only convicted of a sex offense for registration purposes, if you committed it after the date that that offense became registrable. So hypothetically, if this had passed and became law July 1st of 2024, you would have to be convicted of one of those offenses after that date of uh, committing one after that date, not convicted but of committing it after that date. And I, I could not come up with anything that really sounded better, but that sounds, I mean, it's clear enough that you understand it, right? I think so, yeah. So. What are the new offenses then? Well, I think there's four, maybe five of them. So, and I won't repeat myself over and over, but patronizing prostitutes as described in Section B of 30 9 3 New Mexico Statutes Annotated, when there's a separate finding of fact that the offender knew or should have known that the person believed to be the prostitute was younger than 16. So, now that, that provision there about the separate finding of fact remains consistent for all of the offenses that they're wanting to add. So for, so the next one is promoting prostitution as provided in Section 30-9-4 NMSA. The same finding is required. They should have known. The other one, the next one, is accepting earnings of a prostitute as defined in the appropriate section of New Mexico law. Same provision. And then human trafficking for sexual purpose when the victim is under 16 years of age. And those are the biggies. Now, the other one is criminal sexual communication with a child. And that one uh, 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 is doesn't require that separate finding. You just have to do it, I mean sending your junk or something like that to a child. <laughs> but but, uh, uh, but although the, 
the, the uh, this is my language, I, I wanted to make certain that we protected all previous pleas where the clients were told they were not required to register. And we may need to address this further, and I put this for the, for the analyst when we got it to, to the next committee, but fortunately didn't move beyond the uh, first committee. So so we didn't have to address this as it moved forward. So, so uh, the bill died. It was not acceptable and there just wasn't time to fix it. But I did not summarily dismiss this one like I have so many in the past. This one was worth saving. And registration of certain juvenile offenses, offenders is necessary for AWA compliance. Was that in the proposal? It was, and they used my parameters. And those parameters are, one, that the, list, that the listed uh, juveniles will not be listed publicly. They'll be on the internal list, but they, they will be non-public. Two, only aggravated offenses are registrable, not the full universe of, of sexual offenses. Uh, uh, they have to be over the age of 14 because that's a part of the federal requirements. The obligation is terminated when the juvenile reaches age 21, and they must register with juvenile authorities, and at the end of the registration period, the registration is destroyed. They agreed to all of that, Interesting. and, uh, and I, I, I was shocked. Certainly. Um, so then what happens after all of that? Uh, well, the problem, the only problem we had was relatively minor. They, they termed the juvenile sexual offenses as the, rather than, I would have preferred aggravated, they use sexually violent, and we, which I can't accept that. Uh, I'd like to get rid of the, that terminology, sexual violence, due to the negative baggage it would be associated with if we let it stand. And the actual federal statute is 34 United States Code 209118 uh, paragraph 8. And the term convicted uh, or a variant thereof used with respect to juveniles is for offense, is for anyone over 14 or age at the time. And they have to be uh, adjudicated as a juvenile for something comparable or more severe than aggravated sexual abuse. Now, that's where they pull the aggravated for, but it doesn't say that. It says something comparable or more severe than that. So I want to use to something other than sexual violence to describe those offenses because otherwise we've got the juveniles tagged as being sexually violent. Everybody would be carrying that label of being violent and I can't live with that. So you also had some other problems, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, on, on uh, page 14, 15, uh, uh, they, they're attempting to change the requirement for updates uh, and registration from the current five business days to immediately. And that's inconsistent with federal law, and it's not workable at all. What does immediately mean? And uh, such I'm language... <laughs> it doesn't it mean kind of like now? Like yesterday yes. even? Uh, yes, but but it, immediate could be, if you're online right now, do you immediately, do you have to do it this second, or do you have to the end of the day? Uh, this that's Such true. language would invite a plethora of arrests and a constitutional challenge. So that we have to fix. And they proposed to categorically classify a person as lifetime in New Mexico if they were lifetime in their state of conviction. And I have real problems with that in terms of the constitutionality. And I can understand their intent. What they're trying to do is to stop the state shoppers. And I can understand that. Who wants people to come pouring in here that are lifetime? I get that. But we do have an equal protection clause in our constitution. When a person becomes a resident and citizen, here, they're entitled to be protected as every other New Mexican is. And I have a real problem with saying, well, we're going to make you a lifetime here because you're a lifetime in Alabama. I just I can't I can't quite go along with that. And then uh, what about listing of employers information? Did you have problems with that? I did. It, the effect of it would they would be making all adult registrants employment visible on the Internet under current law. It's only supposed to be displayed if the registrant has, quote, direct contact with children. Now, they go beyond that. They consider incidental contact as to be direct enough contact. But there, there are a number of registrants that are not listed. Their employers are not listed. That is a very debilitating thing for the, for the employer as well as the registrant. The employer doesn't want you, and the registrant can't make a living. Now, Larry, at the, at the risk of circling back around and taking too much time on this, how much input did you have that the, what was it, the DPS picked up to carry the language that, and I want to, like, specifically, you provided them? Well, what the way it came about is I had drafted a bill, and I didn't 
ask it to be put forward this year because I truly didn't want to try to do a bill in a short session. So what would have been sponsored as our bill didn't get put in, but the potential sponsor of our bill provided it to DPS and they took what they could live with. I'm deducing that because we haven't really had a thorough conversation. I'm deducing that they took what they could live with from the bill and they canned things that they couldn't live with. But this is the closest we've ever come to something that we can live with that's constitutional and won't be causing lots of litigation. And I think we could get that substantial compliant designation and it would help people because a lot of people are right now under under the law or, or lifetime and they won't be under this proposal. They've got the tiering done fairly well, not not completely where the, where they should have, al- have aligned some of the offenses, but they've done a good job aligning the offenses. They took most of my recommendations on the alignment. Uh, so to me, it's a win-win if we can get this done right. The state gets their precious burn grants and people have a pathway off the registry. And you're just a lowly paralegal. How do you, how do you, Larry, write a bill that ends up in their hands to then be submitted to all these politicians and whatnot, like the, the elected officials? How does that happen? Well, you build a relationship with, with lawmakers, a few key lawmakers, and you establish your reputation of competency. And I think you saw an email that I forwarded where the, where the, the uh, one of the analysts said that uh, uh, the person was referring me to the next committee analyst and said he knows more about this than anybody in the state. You remember that email? I do. Yeah. Well, that's how you do that. You build relationships with with people who analyze bills, and trust me, they want your input as long as you're competent and as long as you're objective, because every time they're in session, they have more bills than they can thoroughly analyze. And if a competent individual can give them a a succinct analysis without going on and on and on with reams of stuff, they will use it. Don't don't bring them the 300-page binder of recidivism uh, statistics? No, I think I even sent you my analysis of what I sent. What was it, about a page? Something like that, yeah. Yes, that's what they need. And you will become very well appreciated because you're saving them work and you're making them look good if you form relationships with lawmakers and with particularly the analyst. And I didn't have a full appreciation of the analyst in my earlier days. I thought, well, gee, I mean, they're just uh, pushers of paper. Well, they're a lot more than that. They tell the lawmakers what questions to ask in committee hearings, where the problem points are. And when you've got people that are serving the assembly that don't know this stuff and they're looking at a good uh, analysis, they're asking questions as if they know something. They don't have a clue what they're asking, but, but someone prepared those questions for them. Are you a first time listener of Registry Matters? Well, then make us a part of your daily routine and subscribe today. Just search for Registry Matters through your favorite podcast app, hit the subscribe button, and you're off to the races. You can now enjoy hours of sarcasm and snark from Andy and Larry on a weekly basis. Oh, and there's some excellent information thrown in there too. Subscribing also encourages others of you people to get on the bandwagon and become regular Registry Matters listeners. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to Registry Matters right now. Help us keep fighting and continue to say F Y. Gotcha. All right. Well, then enough of that. I I, I just want to I want to highlight that we have these abilities that you are certainly special, Larry, but you're not special, that we could build these relationships of shaking hands and whatnot and building these relationships and then put forth some sort of bill analysis that would help them with their job and then perhaps like that builds up and you are then the person and that's not the Larry you, but the we you of making things better for us. Well, I didn't even know about this bill. I received a phone call because it was the last day, actually it was the day before the final day for introduction. And I was b- about ready to close the books. You know, the DPS was not going to be able to have their sort of bill in. And I got a call from the analyst. And he said, have you looked at 282? And I said, no. And he said, well, it it's introduced. And he said, we're hearing it tomorrow. And I said, oh. 
So it just got introduced. Are you hearing it tomorrow? He said, yeah, we got to move quickly. He said, I need help on the analysis. And I fed the analysis, uh, like I say, but it was one page. If we could get people to open their minds, the biggest thing is closed minds that I encounter is they refuse to accept the reality of how these processes work. And they go in thinking that in their way of explaining things, they say, well, everybody wants to know all these facts. Uh, they may want to know them, but they just can't get that deep into the weeds. And you need to give them bullet points. And it's very tempting to give them way more than they need. Right. When we get into the West Virginia bill, you're going to see that. I think he gave a six-page analysis where I gave one. And uh, the six pages is not going to be read because nobody who receives that is going to know who it came from. And it'd be very lucky if anybody opens it. But let's let's quickly go over to Oklahoma. I, I didn't mean to drag that out that long. I just want to make it c clear that we can do these things and uh, uh, we typically don't. But all right. Anyway, Oklahoma, uh, there are a couple of bills pending there. What are they? Uh, Senate Bill 1890 and House Bill 3992. Senate Bill 1890 is short and simple, and that's the one we're going to focus on tonight. The House Bill, I'm going to try to bring it back next week. It's 46 pages, and I'm going to try to uh, connect with some people in local, Oklahoma and see if they've done a thorough analysis. That'll save me some work. But uh, on Senate Bill 1890, it's funny. <laughs> Larry funny or like the world funny? <laughs> Oh, well, I always think what I think is funny is funny, but um, but it has a provision in there. And I'm going to read it. Any person who has been convicted, whether upon verdict or plea of guilty or upon plea of no will contendere, or received a suspended sentence or a probationary term or parole for such crime, re which requires him or her to register as a PFR pursuant to the terms of the PFR Registration Act, shall not enter into a plea agreement whereby the offender shall be allowed to forego registering as a PFR. That's one funny part. So this is from a state who believes in judicial discretion. They're taking it away. And the second part is the sealing of criminal record or other action that limits the publicity or availability of conviction information shall not remove the requirement of the individual to register as a PFR pursuant to the provisions of the PFR Act. So what this is making emphatically clear, if it wasn't clear enough, is that um, if you have an expungement or anything like that, you still have to be registered. You have, still have to register. And the funniest part of the proposal is a new section of law to be codified in the Oklahoma statutes as Section 590.3 of Title 57. Unless there's a, and they, this is internally, unless there's a duplicate, duplicate in, in the numbering scheme, it reads as follows. A person required to register in the provisions of the PFR Registration Act shall not be allowed to have any contact with a person under, with a person under the age of 18 years, including the child of such offender. That and would mean your own biological ch chirins, or probably even not biological, if you happen to have adopted one prior to. Yes. Now, uh, this would become effective November 1st, 2024. Now, can you admit that at least that section's funny? That's not funny. <laughs> can, can, do you think that the Oklahomans can kill this proposal? This particular bill, um, I believe they have a better chance of making headway with it because of the case law that's already in existence. There's already been two similar things in Alabama and in Tennessee regarding no contact, including your own children. So I think that there's hope, but it's going to be tough for them to do because I don't think they're that well organized and they have just overwhelming lopsided majorities uh, that Republicans hold. The Democrat Party barely exists in Oklahoma. Well, I they think don't want to be I'm, communists there. Uh, I think if I remember right, there's 38 senators and 30 of, of them are, 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 are um, Republicans. And you see, that's more than a supermajority. And I think in the House, it's 101. I think 80 of the 101 are, are Republicans. So, so folks, if you're going to do, do any talking to anybody, don't waste any time going to any, any member of the Democrat Party in Oklahoma. They can't do anything for you. This is all being run by the Republicans.
And then uh, let's move over to West Virginia. What's going on there? Well, we're like I said, we're not completely done with Oklahoma, but we are for this episode. We'll have hopefully House Bill 3992, which is 46 page long. And we'll do that uh, next episode if I can be prepared and I need time to study. But we've got House Bill 5502, which is a bill to bring West Virginia substantial compliance with Adam Walsh Act, otherwise known as SORNA. AWA compliance, shouldn't, shouldn't we just automatically get pitchforks and go to the state capitol and say, no, hell no, we won't go? Uh, no, not necessarily. It's totally dependent on the state's existing law, the structure of the registry as it currently exists. If you were in Vermont, you would want to do exactly that. But so if, you're would... in, if, you're, if you're in if you're in Mississippi, Alabama, <laughs> Louisiana, you would want to take a look at the existing law and find out how bad it is and then compare it to the AWA. And in many instances, if you would be objective, remember I said objectivity is what they're looking for. If you would objectively look at your existing law and then you would look at the AWA, if you had a good analytical framework, you'd come back and say, I love this Adam Walsh Act because it would be better than what we have right now if it's done correctly. Um, so did you analyze this bill yourself? Uh, I did analyze some of it, yes. Uh, uh, I did a partial analysis. I think that'd be uh, fair to say. I didn't I didn't cover the tier alignment because the offenses they're too numerous and there were too many uh there were too many nuances but i did i did do some analysis and what did you identify as problematic well there are a number of issues that need to be addressed during the committee process the issues are uh uh it requires information that virtually no resident would have a, a registrant would have in their possession on page three lines 51 through 55 the following information relating to the criminal history of the registrant. Now, just listen to this and tell me that you have this in your pocket. The date of all arrests, the date of all convictions, status of parole, probation or supervised release, and any outstanding warrants. Now, I can't name a soul in 22 years of being in the legal business that can tell you, unless they've only been arrested once, what the dates are of all their arrests, of their convictions, and all this stuff. And most of all, a lot of times you don't know when a warrant's out for you. That's something that's in the computer system. You don't yeah, I mean, know that. Wouldn't, wouldn't a lot of warrants be issued that they then just spring on you, not giving you a chance to flee? Yes, and this information that they're requiring of the registrant, it would already be in possession of law enforcement. But the under, unintended consequence would be that many would almost be, it'd be, be impossible to comply with this. And so therefore you run the risk of having needless violations related to this particular section that's in the new legislation. This needs to be fixed. How would you fix it? And could that be done easily? Yes, you actually could fix it easily. It could be fixed by moving the placement of the language. There is there is such a provision in the Adam Walsh Act, but it's a requirement on the state to make this type of information available on their website. And if they move this uh, requirement to say that the, that the internet website shall contain this information, that's fine, but not a requirement on the, the offender to provide it. So I would very calmly and tell them, yes, you're headed in the right direction. This is a part of the AWA compliance package, but you've put the onus on the wrong party. This is something that goes in the internet website shall contain the following, and that would fix that. What would happen if you gave them the wrong or um, inadequate, like, I mean, if you, it says date of all arrests, if you got r arrested multiple times, does that even apply to things not related to, to this? Like you got arrested when you were 18 for a bar fight back in 1980. I mean, would that count? And if, if you didn't provide it, then what are the consequences? You go to, well, back to prison for not providing it? The consequences would be a potential prosecution because Jesus. Date of all arrest. That doesn't say all sexual offense arrests. Now, remember, right. we're we're textualists around here, right, Andy? Of course we are, because we're not communists. Or, I mean, we yes. are. Yeah, we're not communists. Okay. As in the, in the textual world, uh, Justice Scalia would sit there and look at you straight in the face and say, well, what does this say, Mr. Andy? Does it say date of sexual offense arrest? Or does it say all arrest? It does say all. 
Okay, so that would be all inclusive of any arrest. And so I can see a person in a PFR registration office who doesn't like a particular PFR saying, well, you know, I was looking over your disclosure list here, and I see you've missed about four of your arrests. And two of your convict those arrests resulted in convictions. You didn't dis- you didn't uh, disclose that. Right. And in fact, there's a warrant out for you. <laughs> a, w- a what? A warrant. <laughs> um. <laughs> so the next issue really isn't that significant either. Correct. Uh, it, it, the next issue, uh, the the problem I see on the next issue is the advanced notice of international travel. But as it's written, it actually benefits the offender. Because the, uh, it says 21 business days rather than what the Walsh Act requires, which is 21 calendar days. Now, I know I'm kind of retarded, but I can figure out 21 business days. It's going to be more than 21 calendar days. So that inures to your benefit. But the problem I run into, since I didn't see where they defined what a business day is, uh-huh. would be if you miscalculate. So say you do a miscalculation on a business day, and you get down there to the West Virginia PFR office and you say, well, here's my international travel notice. And they look at the calendar and say, yeah, you reported it, but this is on, uh, this don't quite work out because you counted business days that weren't really countable and you two days late. Right. You could, you could, you could count, you could skip a holiday, perhaps. Uh, so I would prefer that for simplicity, that you keep that consistent with what's required under the Adam Walsh Act, which is what you're trying to comply with. So the proposed language is, is okay, but I would prefer that we use uh, what the provisions of the Walsh Act so that we don't have the confusion. I'm guessing that the next one would be a deal breaker. It would be for me. Indeed, this one, this, these other things can be fixed that I, that I pointed out. And I, I remember I didn't do the tier alignment. The tier alignment could be a tier, deal, deal breaker as well. But since I didn't do that, I'm not going to comment about the tier alignment. But this imposes residence restrictions on page 16, line 17 through 20, effective January 1st, 2026. During the duration of the registration period, no registrant may reside within 2,500 feet of any public or private school or daycare facility. Any registrant that is found to be residing within 2,500 feet of a public or private school or daycare facility shall be subject to the penalty provided in the appropriate section of this code. Based on the current law, this would apply to uh, retroactively to all registrants because it says on effective January 1, 2026, during the period of registration. I don't see any wiggle room. So this would apply both retroactively and prospectively. If you look at West Virginia law, it says that the Sex Offender PFR Registration Act applies both retroactively and prospectively. This means that registrants would be forced out of their existing homes. Such attempts to displace registrants have been repeatedly held unconstitutional by both, both federal and state courts. And beyond that, homeless registrants are far more difficult to monitor and track, which makes citizens less safe. And most importantly, Residency restrictions are not contemplated, thought about, suggested, recommended, or any part of the Adam Walsh Act. And just about to ask that. <laughs> so I'm going to ask people, if you have a state that has resident restrictions, I would go make a deal with them. I said, look, we'll do the whole damn Adam Walsh Act, but no more. Got a deal? And they say, yes, because they don't realize that this is not a part yeah. of that Walsh Act. And I say, guess what? We have to strip out all these restrictions, prohibition, exclusion zones, all this stuff. All this stuff comes out. Uh, because if you're only doing the Adam Walsh Act, all this stuff is not a part of it. Um, and I understand that uh, the West Virginia NARSOL affiliate sent an analysis to the House Judiciary Committee. What did you think of their analysis? Overall, it was actually quite good. Unfortunately, they made some of the common strategic mistakes. First of all, it was too long to send via email because it isn't likely to be read. And second, it contained a sentence that I strongly urge that they remove and it appears that they did not. <laughs> what, what, what was that sentence? It says, West Virginians for Rational Sexual Offense Laws, WVRSOL, is a West Virginia nonprofit association and affiliate of the National Association for Rational Sexual Offense Laws. 
conditionally supports House Bill 5502 because, one, it aligns West Virginia more closely with the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act of 2006, SORTA, Substantial Information Implementation Review, and, two, it provides for registry relief for a group of registrants not previously available. You would never want to include the second part of that in the oh, sentence. I see, because it makes it, yeah, uh, no one wants to be uh, uh, highlighted, spotlighted for being nice to PFRs. So, well, let me let me put my spin on it. Let's just say that House Judiciary Committee has 15 members. And say there's someone on that committee who's as nutty as I am. You remember the story I told you about coming to the office at like at 10 o'clock on a Friday night and I was going through phone calls and emails and a person had called about that parking bill that was uh, going to make it where you had to, uh, it, it, you're going to have to have a, a, a notify the person with certified yes. mail that you're, yes, well, there might be, or that 15, there might be someone as nutty as I am out there. Would you agree with that? There might be one. There may be one. I don't know about as nutty, but close in the ballpark. Okay. Okay. So suppose that nut actually reads this analysis, even though he doesn't recognize, he or she doesn't recognize where this is coming from. And they see it provides register relief for a group of registrants not previously available. And let's just suppose that nut is in a con- in a contested seat where it's not a surefire winner. There, there might be a few seats in the West Virginia Assembly that are competitive. And so that person tells their senator uh, or their representative, hey, now I saw this in this West Virginians uh, RSOL, this group. It looks like this is a bunch of sex offender advocates. And I saw in here it says it provides register relief for registers not previously available. And I don't know what that means, but that's a good question you all to ask. So when the the committee is hearing the bill, that person is going to say, Mr. Chairman, I looked at this analysis that came through here from this West Virginia RSOL thingy, and it says it provides relief for a group of registrants not previously available. Can we get some input here from the state popo to explain to us who gets relieved, what the offenses were that they committed, when did they get that relief, and how is that going to work, and is that going to make us safer here in West Virginia? Right. Why would you that, invite? Why would you invite that to be a part of the dialogue? I, I can see that. Would you also just address it as being from you and not from your organization? Uh, no, I, the organization would be okay, but I would have been organizationally. I would have been in opposition to the bill, uh, and then with my personal relationships, I would be going tell it, pass it, pass it, pass it. It's okay, pass the bill, <laughs> but we're going to be steadfast against it. Right. And uh, because the last thing an uh, elected official was going to want to do is to vote for something that the sex offenders are for. Sure. Yep. I got you on that one. So. <sighs> All right, then. Do you want to cover anything else? Do you want to cover this article real quick or do you want to just call it? I think we've done a great job running off of what audience we have left going through this stuff here from West Virginia. And I apologize for my horrible accent, but I was trying to talk like a West Virginian that that used to work in the coal mines. I totally understand that. I don't think that's how the West Virginia sound, and that's definitely not how Louisianians <laughs> sound. We're going to have to get uh, Brian in Louisiana to, to send us a voicemail with, with a full-on Bayou Cajun Homa Louisiana accent because it's something special. Well, now, I have been in West Virginia two or three times in my life, and they don't sound much different than what I was imitating there, with, particularly in the parts where they used to mine coal before they shut all that down. They sound pretty hillbilly out there. Oh, they definitely sound hillbilly. I, we, we need some banjo picking music, too. So, But yes, they did a great job on the analysis. It's way too long. But if it gets read... They succinctly identified. He did kind of a hybrid version of what I did. He, on the first page, he put the, the seven bullet pointed concerns that he has, and he did that very succinctly. And then he went on the remaining pages and explained what it would take to fix those, and he went into great detail. So if they at least read page one, barring that sentence that I think was left in there, it appears to be left in the copy that I got, if that sentence was in there, that is potentially a problem that shouldn't have been left in there. You, you don't go out and say, hey, we're going to give people a, a pathway off the registry. Right, 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 right. 
Well, before we head out, Larry, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming I haven't heard from you about any snail mail subscribers lately, but we did get two new patrons, Joshua and Seth. Thank you so very much. Welcome to the family. If you want to link your Patreon account to your Discord account, then you'll have all those things opened up on the, uh, on, on the Discord server to listen to the show live and whatnot. So anything else, Larry, before I close things out? I don't think we have anything else, but uh, since uh, we've uh, not got our partner here now, you can ask me how much longer I'm going to stay because oh, you need, I guess I you need me. You, you need me now. I do need you. Uh, there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have to so, compensate for that knucklehead that's gallivanting uh, uh, across the globe. So uh, I was hoping he would give me some downtime because uh, he's such a good, soothing voice without all the snark that I have. I figured that people could have a week of snark and then a week without it, and they could compare the two. Very good. Well, um, so head over to Registry Matters. Uh, dot co for the show notes and where you can get the podcast and all that stuff and i'm just going to leave it all there because obs has decided to crash on me and i'm not able to change screens anymore so i'm just going to call it from there technical difficulties larry i hope you have a great night everyone else have a great weekend and thanks for hanging out i see already people leaving which is really tragic and uh but i will talk to you soon my friend good night good night